Nice job. Uh, so with that, uh, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is Dick Weiner. I'm the Open Channel Project Manager, uh, and I would like to welcome you to Principles for Effective Stakeholder Engagement in Marine Planning. Uh, and many thanks to our presenters, Brian Manwaring and Laura Nutter, for offering this training for us all. Uh, so just a few technical notes to get started. Um, and I am talking really fast, John. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just noticed that. There is, FYI, uh, a part of a technical note. Uh, the little hand raise icon at the top of the screen has a bunch of um, little icons for things you can let us know. For instance, if I'm talking ridiculously fast, which I tend to do, uh, you could also tell us if you can't hear us, there's a speak louder, a louder or softer uh, button up there as well. And raise hand if you have any technical difficulties. Uh, so we really want this training to be a discussion. We're going to have 45 minutes of discussion after Brian and Lauren's initial presentation is done. Um, so we encourage everybody to use the chat box down there in the bottom left, which everybody has been really good at using so far. Um, also, for those of you that have your microphones already working, uh, you know, feel free to unmute yourselves then when we're in the discussion section, and then we can all chat with each other. Uh, so speaking of that, we want to know your thoughts on Adobe Connect. As John mentioned earlier, this is our first time using Adobe Connect for a training such as this, and we think it has a lot of potential, and we would like to know your feedback on this. Uh, so there's a link down there in the notes box. Uh, you can just copy and paste that into your favorite web browser and take that quick little survey, just seven questions. Uh, it's also in the email I sent you guys out just before this got started. Uh, so when Brian and Lauren are done their presentation, we're going to continue this as a full discussion, so just make sure you have your microphones ready after that presentation is over. Uh, so if you have any technical difficulties at all, uh, please email me. Uh, my email is down there in the notes section at the bottom, nwainer at openchannels.org. Uh, you can also raise your hand or use the chat box. Uh, you can also privately chat with us if you want if you click one of the host names. Uh, you can start a private chat in case you don't want everybody knowing about your technical difficulty. So with that, our presenters will be Brian Manmaring and Lauren Nutter from the Udall Foundation's U.S. Institute for Environmental Conflict Resolution. Uh, Brian is a senior program manager who manages several of the Udall Foundation's uh, related, or projects related to implementing the U.S. National Ocean Policy uh, at the national level and at the regional level. He's trained as a mediator and a facilitator with broad experience in stakeholder engagement and coordinating multi-stakeholder planning and conflict resolution processes. Uh, Lauren is a program assistant based in the Washington, D.C. office. She works closely with Brian on the Foundation's U.S. National Ocean Policy Project. Uh, previous to her work with the Institute, Lauren worked internationally on youth empowerment in environmental decision making and has conducted related stakeholder research, or stakeholder engagement research in Turkey, India, Belgium, Holland, Peru, and Argentina, all places I would love to go. Uh, Brian and Lauren primarily work on projects involving water resources, including freshwater and marine and coastal issues. And with that, you all should stop listening to me mumble over here, and I'm going to hand it over to Brian and Lauren. Uh, thank you guys both for offering this training today. All right. Thank you, Nick. And by the way, can everybody hear me? Can, can somebody just indicate yes. that? I'm... All right. So um, yeah, thank you, Nick. And, and I want to thank everybody for joining this morning. I'm looking at the, uh, the poll on the right-hand side, and I'm, I'm staggered by the, the, the diversity of, of places that people are calling in from. I'm particularly staggered by the people who, who are calling in from somewhere in Asia or, or other places where I don't know what time it is, but it's, it's a lot different than it is here. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, and um, as Nick mentioned, I'm Brian Manwaring, and uh, I'm here with Lauren Nutter. And, uh, it, we're, um, our presentation today was co-authored by, um, by our colleague Suzanne Ornstein, who's uh, our, our office director, our DC office director. Uh, we're, Lauren and I are with the U.S. Institute for Environmental Conflict Resolution, which is a program of the Udall Foundation. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with us, we are a, U, a United States federal agency. Uh, we're a small microagency. We're about 25 to 30 people total. Uh, we were created by Congress in 98 as an in independent and an impartial uh, entity to help groups um, collaborate and, and find workable solutions to uh, challenging environmental issues. 
and there typically needs to be a, a federal nexus for us to be involved. Uh, we developed this uh, material and the presentation with support from the uh, Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. And um, we just want to um, give our gratitude to our partners on, on the phone with us uh, from Open Channels, both Nick and John, um, as well as Sarah Carr with the Ecosystem-Based Management Tools Network, who've been um, uh, one incredible host and um, very patient with us as we've been uh, working through the technology. So um, for the objectives for our training today, it, we want to develop an awareness of principles and best practices for stakeholder engagement in marine planning. Uh, we also want to examine the benefits and the challenges of public and stakeholder engagement and establish an understanding of the tools and techniques uh, available to enable stakeholder and public engagement in marine planning processes. So when we talk about the principles, um, there's not one overarching set of principles uh, that guides everything. What we're talking about are a set of principles that we, we at the U.S. Institute developed back in 2011, and we've created a white paper uh, around it, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about later. But we, we developed the white paper and the principles, and stemming from that, we developed this training, um, which we've given in an open setting. We've given to uh, one of the regions here in the U.S. Um, around national ocean policy. And we really developed the material for a variety of audiences. So not only the, um, the folks implementing marine planning, the decision makers, the planners, uh, but also the stakeholders themselves so they understand better uh, what their rights are, what, um, how to engage better in, in these kinds of processes. Um, so really, this is really developed for, for a, a wide variety of people. And as John mentioned earlier, our session today is we see is somewhat of a laboratory in some sense practicing the same principles that um, we're, we're trying to uh, convey here. So we are, we feel like, to some degree, pushing the limits of the technology. Um, I, you know, I'm sure this has been done before, uh, but it's by no means been refined or perfected. Um, and we really want to engage with you in a dialogue um, more than just presenting information. So we're trying to do all this and uh, trying to experiment with this. And um, uh, so we'll do our best. And, and we hope it's a good experience for everybody. Um, so we've already done this poll. And like I said, this is, or we did the first poll at least. We wanted to get an understanding of where folks were from. And um, yeah, it's quite interesting, the, the diversity of, of where, where people are joining us from. So it looks, and we divided the, the uh, US into the regions uh, stated in the National Ocean Policy. So it looks like about 25 to 35 people from the United States, uh, 10 from Canada, 17 from Europe, some folks from um, Latin America and, and Asia and uh, one from other international. So uh, just a wide, um, a wide uh, variety of, of locations folks are coming from. And Nick, can you queue up the, the next poll? I will switch that over right now. So we also want to know what kinds of organizations you, you represent. Um, so if you can, just uh, quickly uh, vote on, or, or not vote, but select the, uh, the, the right category. All right, why don't we go with that for now? Um, I think that gives us a good representative sort of understanding. Um, so quite a few from the government and uh, from the government, both for federal, state, and local, local government, as well as from the scientific um, and academic community. Um, we have some non-governmental 
um, representatives in some industry and commerce as well. So um, that gives us an idea of, of who's on the line um, and and um, who's all participating in, in the training. So um, why don't we review the agenda and, and move forward with the material. First, as Nick mentioned, this is we have about an hour and a half with you. Uh, the material itself is about 45 minutes of presentation, both Lauren and I will be providing. Uh, and then we want about 45 minutes of discussion. I think we're integrating some of that, so it may not be an, uh, exactly an even split, but we'll, we'll be around those times. Um, here's our agenda. The uh, one we want to just get grounded in stakeholder engagement and how it intersects with marine planning and what we're ta when we talk about marine planning, what we mean. Um, then we'll kind of dig into the principles, and that's really going to be the core uh, or really the heart of the presentation and the most material we discuss. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we'll talk a little bit about stakeholder engagement planning. Our previous, we have a lot more material on that, but um, we wanted to um, keep this more discussion-based, so we, we uh, limited the material on the planning process. So, um, so we'll go ahead and get started with um, grounding ourselves in, in marine planning and, and stakeholder engagement. So um, just so we're all on the same page, for our purposes, marine planning uh, can be synonymous with a number of different terms. And within the, the United, States, United States National Ocean Policy, um, the term coastal and marine spatial planning is used throughout the documentation or it's codified in, in the policy itself. Uh, but through the years since 2010, when the policy um, was initiated, the, the terminology has um, at least uh, it's changed to some degree or it's evolved. And um, I see more of the regions and more of the folks involved refer to it as marine planning than as coastal marine sp spatial planning. Uh, of course, it all essentially means the same thing. Um, other terms we've heard, maritime spatial planning, integrated marine and coastal planning. Um, you might have other terms, and you feel free to chat in other things you've, you've other terms you've heard to kind of express uh, the same sorts of thing. Uh, but to be a little more specific about what we're talking about, uh, when we talk about marine planning, uh, in there's numerous definitions. Um, from, again, the U.S. National Ocean Policy um, to uh, the U.N. to several other resources for, for defining uh, what marine planning is. What we found is all these definitions, or most of these definitions, have these common characteristics, uh, one being it's multi-objective. Multi so the marine planning processes look to integrate um, economic concerns and issues, uh, environmental and social and cultural issues all together. Uh, making it, of course, quite complex and, and challenging. Um, next, ecosystem-based. Um, it's also integrated at, at a number of different levels. So it integrates government at different levels. In the U.S., you have uh, federal, state, local. Um, you have so sovereign um, tribal government. Um, it integrates the end users with the decision makers. It integrates, as we mentioned, the ecology with the economic and social issues. Um, it integrates ocean uses across um, most, if not all, ocean uses, and so on. So it's an integrated process. It's spatially focused, um, or basically it's place and or area-based. Um, it's adaptive, so it takes into account uncertainty and the evolution. Um, it understands that our understanding evolves over time and needs to be engaged or incorporated into our um, thoughts about managing the oceans and coasts. Um, it's strategic and anticipatory, so it's really focused on the long term. And uh, for us, most importantly, it's participatory. Um, and as you can see through these other characteristics, it would be uh, almost impossible for it not to be participatory, um, given its multi-objective and integrated and um, strategic um, grounding. So with that, we're going to focus on the participatory aspect here today. And just as an example, we wanted to um, highlight the importance of participation and stakeholder engagement in marine planning by just pulling this out of the, the U.S. National Ocean Policy. This is just one quote that comes out of the recommendations that were then turned into 
uh, the national ocean policy through an executive order signed by uh, President Obama in 2010. And as the slide notes, the recommendations uh, emphasize the uh, frequent and robust stakeholder scientific and public engagement. Um, if you read through the rest of the documentation around national ocean policy, um, references to stakeholder sci scientists and public engagement are, are littered throughout the um, literature. And since then, there's been additional guidance set forth by the National Ocean Council. And um, they, again, um, stress and highlight the importance of, of um, engaging stakeholders in the process. So really, in theory and by definition, most marine planning efforts do place a high value on stakeholder engagement. And um, the question is really why. Um, and here are some, some of the reasons and some of the benefits um, of stakeholder engagement. Um, one is uh, improved and sustainable outcomes because it's building on that local capacity and knowledge um, and it addresses the needs of local communities and local stakeholders. It helps build shared understanding and given its multi-objective nature, um, just developing that shared understanding of each other's needs, of the constraints, of the possibilities and opportunities um, it helps stakeholders and planners understand what uses can coexist, and it can help identify areas of potential conflict and help resolve those areas uh, before they become real problems. Uh, it uh, helps transparency and, and develop ownership in the outcome, strengthens relationships. Uh, so it's a forum, it's really for a forum of all these parties interested in the same um, types of things to get together and um, of course, if we understand the relationship aspect of it, as the relationships have started much, much earlier than our marine planning process and will continue on past it. So this is just one point in that relationship process um, and an important aspect of bringing stakeholders together. Um, it can improve cost effectiveness. We do have some data to, that indicates that people perceive that well, I, I should mention that we do, we evaluate all of our multi-stakeholder processes here at the U.S. Institute. And um, the, the data that we've gathered is pretty overwhelming that um, stakeholders do feel that it is cost effective, that it does reduce uh, or manage conflict and contention. It does better inform decisions. Of course, it's impossible to, or at least there hasn't been a way figured out to, to prove that through the numbers yet. Um, just given the, uh, the nature of it, if you do, if you engage stakeholders, you can't measure against the process that, that did not engage stakeholders. So, um, if you have other thoughts of benefit, feel free to chat them in so, um, so folks can hear your thoughts. But otherwise, I think we have another poll coming up. And Nick, can you see the, the, the next one up? So the question we have for you is, whether you're currently involved in a, in, in a marine planning process or you're about to be, what has been or what do you anticipate to be the biggest obstacle or obstacles uh, in planning for and implementing a good stakeholder engagement process? So we've listed a couple um, options here so you can read through those. And I think you can vote on multiple options. Uh, but also if you see something, a, a challenge or, or an obstacle, or if you know of an obstacle or a challenge that's not listed in, in the um, list here, go ahead and chat it in um, so we can see those. Ryan, while people are still voting on that, I'll read one from uh, Marta who's checked chatting in to us. Um, what about stakeholder fatigue? That would be one, and Ben Peter seconds that for us.
try and I'll read off some more comments that we're getting in. Um, widespread, the wide geographic spread of stakeholders, limitations on ability for stakeholder input to inform decision making. Um, someone mentioned stakeholder fatigue might be the same as reluctance, or they might be interrelated. Inequality and power relationships between stakeholders. Um, disputed politics and lobbyists. Lack of sufficient participation then makes process suspect not viewed as legitimate. Um, others echoing inequality and power relationships between stakeholders and staff. Low political will. Um, the squeaky wheel takes the most time and attention from central issues. So we have many, many possible conflicts and um, obstacles we're hearing here, Brian. <laughs> Yeah, and I would say I, we really appreciate everybody um, weighing in. This is really great uh, input. Um, the fatigue, I think, is is a real um, a common one that that we're all um, to some degree, whether it's it's working on um, ocean and coastal issues or, or not, that um, we're all trying to to work through. And, um, it's really a, a challenging issue. Okay. Lauren, anything else, or shall we? Um, people are still sharing, and I, I think they're they're great. And so maybe we'll let people continue um, sharing a bit. But maybe just Brian to reflect on that the poll with the options we gave people. I think it was pretty evenly divided with the top. Um, you know, obstacles that people chose being resource constraints, conflicting interests, um, knowledge and education stakeholders also being high up. Um, I believe everyone can see the, the numbers in those poll results, though, but um, you can see that there's, there's quite a few issues. So we'll let people continue uh, sharing on the chat. And uh, Brian, you want to advance to the next slide? Sure. OK, great. So now we're going to go ahead and dive into the, uh, the principles for stakeholder engagement. And um, before we, we go too far um, or we get into the actual principles themselves, um, we want to um, at least the, lay the foundation and, and, again, make sure we're all on the same page. So um, first and foremost, the training, as I mentioned earlier, in this, um, in this training is based on a white paper we put together with um, principles and best practices for stakeholder engagement. So we're just really touching on the surface here. And, um, there's a lot more material out, out there, and we'll send you um, that white paper and also a shorter version of it after we're, we're done with this um, uh, presentation. We'll also send a presentation, and as Nick mentioned earlier, we're, we're recording this as well. Um, just to note, in developing this material and the principles, we uh, reviewed different marine planning-based stakeholder efforts, both um, in the United States and interna internationally. Um, we, uh, we also are standing on the shoulders of others, uh, academics, government folks, um, stakeholders. Uh, we've been looking at surveys, white papers, other articles. Uh, we looked at other industries, and we drew from our, our own experience. And I should note that these principles have been incorporated in the, in the Marine Planning Handbook uh, here with the, that was written by the National Ocean Council uh, for uh, the U.S. National Ocean Policy Implementation. So um, again, to ground us, we want to talk a little bit about stakeholders and make sure we have uh, uh, at least a shared understanding or a common understanding of uh, what we mean when we talk about stakeholders. Um, so in each instance, it can be defined differently. It can be defined at a, in a very broad way or, or much more narrow uh, way, depending on the context and the situation and what you're trying to achieve. Um, you know, we could make the broad statement that all citizens have a stake in the management of the ocean and coastal resources, right? It's a public resource. Um, in the United States, almost 50% of our population lives in coastal counties. Um, but even the other 50%, you could say, has a, has a stake in, in how we manage ocean, oceans and coasts. Um, they eat seafood. They receive and purchase uh, goods that are shipped. Um, over the oceans and, and um, 
and they also visit oceans and coasts and, and um, vacation. So there's a wide variety of different kinds of stakeholders and, and a wide variety of ways to define it. So you may have these very obviously affected interest groups um, that are very motivated and, and have the capacity and the, and the resources to participate in, in stakeholder engagement processes. You may have these organized or maybe even less organized groups um, who may not have the capacity, they may not have the willpower or interest to, to participate in everything, but maybe something. And you may have the public who might be impacted and might be interested, but they may not be, but they, maybe they just need to be informed. So you just really have this wide variety of things. So what we wanted to do was cast a, as broad a net as possible. And simply for the purposes of this training, we're talking about stakeholders as entities and interests that are affected by and or can contribute information and support to the marine planning process. So from there, we'll go directly into the principles. So in the circle, you'll see ours, the, the seven principles that we've defined. Um, and these are the principles for stakeholder engagement, marine planning. So starting at the top, and going around the right side of the circle, uh, we have clear goals and avenues for stakeholder and public participation, uh, inclusiveness and accessibility, transparency and openness, informed engagement, timeliness, process integrity, and adaptability and flexibility. So we define these um, principles in part to be building blocks for good process, for good stakeholder engagement process, and good and for good marine planning process. Um, and they can also be help use be used to help guide actions and measure your progress as you uh, go through stakeholder engagement processes. So we're going to go one by one through each of these principles. Um, for each one, we have three slides or three sections. We'll talk about the desired outcome for each principle. We'll talk about implementation guidance for each principle. And then we'll talk about tools and techniques and best practices. Um, so with that, uh, Lauren, I'm going to turn it over to you for the first Great. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Um, and so we're going to start by talking about clear goals and avenues for stakeholder and public participation, which is the first goal. And by establishing a process with clear goals and avenues for participation, you can build a well-planned engagement effort that supports and complements the overall planning process and also enables well-informed stakeholders and citizens who understand the process to capitalize on opportunities for their involvement. Um, identifying and clearly communicating the goals of the planning process, roles and responsibilities of both stakeholders and decision makers, and engagement process, processes and milestones are important to effectively create two-way communication and collaborative problem solving on ocean management issues. And so if we go to our next slide, here's some um, further guidance on how to create clear goals and avenues for stakeholder and public participation. First, several pieces of process information should be identified and communicated to stakeholders, including the goals and schedule for the overall planning process. This is helpful to build a mutual understanding of how stakeholders and the public may be involved in the process and help alleviate concerns among those groups related to the uncertainty of their involvement in the process. Um, it's also important to identify and communicate what and when are the specific opportunities for engagement from stakeholders and the public. It's also important to identify and communicate roles and responsibilities of both stakeholders and decision makers in the process and set clear expectations around this. For example, decision makers may be charged with overall process leadership, final decision making, staffing, information gathering, data analysis, and drafting of preliminary and final documents, among other things. And stakeholder and public roles may include commenting on proposals and processes, providing relevant data and information about the planning process to others and their interest groups, um, identifying implementation issues and concerns, and suggesting alternative approaches, among others. Um, one example of defining roles and responsibilities clearly between stakeholders and decision makers can be seen within the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And in my work, uh, previous to being at the Institute, I was a liaison between the youth constituency uh, in this process and the secretariat the process, and there were clear guidelines from the Secretariat of the Convention that I was responsible for articulating back to the youth stakeholder groups in regards to what their role in the process was and wasn't. Uh, in this case, the country delegations were clearly the decision makers, but civil society had a role in the process to present technical information and guidance at side events during the negotiation process, 
to informally engage with country delegates and share their perspectives and perspective and expertise. And there were set time slots for each stakeholder constituency to make statements in the full plenary with all of the country delegations. And clearly knowing the opportunities for engagement allowed stakeholders present to follow a clear paths to be heard in the process and also ensure that all stakeholder constituencies were equally recognized in the process. So that's one example of how this aspect of the principle might be applied. Um, and going back to what we see on the slide, some further guidance on what to identify and communicate would be up front what types of input are needed and how it will actually be utilized in the process. Also consider engaging stakeholders in the engagement planning process to the greatest extent possible. This can often be overlooked, but it's really key to developing clear goals in the process and gaining buy-in with stakeholders. Uh, Brian will speak a little bit uh, later on about you know, how to actually do this and what it might look like to engage stakeholders in the engagement planning process. Um, and lastly, it can be helpful to institutionalize stakeholder engagement in your process. One example of how to do this would be creating a standing stakeholder committee or advisory group that would be representative of all stakeholder interests and can effectively provide cross-sector stakeholder dialogue and insight into the planning process. So um, some best practices, tools, and techniques that can help you achieve this include um, develop explicit goals relating to stakeholder and public engagement within the overall marine planning process. Develop an engagement approach at the beginning of the process and update it periodically. The approach should be an integral part of the overall planning process and should be adjusted as needed over time since the process will evolve. Uh, develop and share a process map that can clearly outline the points for stakeholder and public input. Uh, visuals that outline the long-term process are helpful for all to understand the full picture. Establish an informational or educational effort at the outset. This can help assure that everyone's on the same page regarding the purpose of marine planning, objectives of the planning process, and the process schedule. And finally, treat stakeholder engagement the same as any other planning component. Make sure to do it early on, integrate it with your other process plans, and seek stakeholder and public input in designing the engagement process itself. And with that, I'll turn it back to Brian to share our next principle. So we're going to talk next about um, inclusiveness and accessibility. So the, um, the challenge here is, as you all know, is one, you may have just the sheer number of stakeholders, the, the, um, the number of people that may need to be integrated into the process in some way, but also the diversity of the interests. Um, the capacity of stakeholders to participate, the, the history of the relationships, all these kinds of things. So um, when we talk about inclusiveness and accessibility, um, you know, one thing we want to look for is a balance and a representative stakeholder effort uh, that helps uh, lead to adequate and appropriate opportunities for interested parties to participate. So some of the key words there are adequate and appropriate, um, which can really differ depending on on the situation, and um, it can be based really on a number of different factors from um, the kind of time pressures and the schedule you're working under or, or the, the planners are working under, uh, the resources, financial resources, staff resources, um, and resources of the stakeholders to participate. Could be societal, societal norms, could be the stakeholder fatigue we were talking about. Um, and other kinds of things. So we have to keep that in mind. It's, it's, it always comes down to what's right for your process. Um, there's also the inclusion of diverse voices, ideas, and, and information to achieve sustainable decisions. Um, so the more diversity and the more voices you can get in, um, the idea and the hope is that you can maximize the compat compatibility of the uses um, of that space, of the ocean and the coast. Um, and you can also ho hopefully identify um, conflict uh, and help manage, resolve, um, uh, or, or address it in some way before it becomes a, a real problem. Lastly, one of the, the big benefits is you, you hope to really increase satisfaction and process with the outcomes. So some of the guidance um, we have is to ensure participation by all interests. So um, that starts with sound, sound planning. Um, identification and outreach, outreach to the full range of, of interest groups, 
Um, and you know, we mentioned one of the things, one of the um, ideas on the in the in the poll on the right hand side is the reluctance of stakeholders to participate. And there's something like 38 percent, 24 people voted for that as a challenge. So that is a challenge. How do you get if you have stakeholders that are that are integral to the process um, and they don't want to participate? Then how do you get them to participate? So. Um, next, we have identify and address barriers to participation. Um, so barriers can include funding, timing, capacity, accessibility, those kinds of things. So there might be limits to stakeholders' ability to participate, um, and it's best to identify those up front and start developing strategies to overcome those. Um, one example of that, on the Missouri River, we, we run a Missouri River um, project where we we facilitate a full stakeholder committee of, of about 70 people. Um, but we also do some really engaged civic engagement with um, not the interest, key, key, the key interest stakeholders, but, but the broader public stakeholders. And we couldn't get them all together. It was just too, 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 much, um, too much effort. Um, the funding needs were, were too great. So one way to address that barrier was to go to them. We went to each state held forums, held day-long forums to, to integrate them in real dialogue around the Missouri River. Um, lastly, we need to be sensitive to the needs, interests, and resource levels of stakeholders and the public. So not every, not every stakeholder is going to want to need or have the interest in participating fully. Um, and so one, we need to know what those are, what those needs are and those interests are, and then we need to be able to um, adapt our process to meet that need. Um, so some best practices, tools, and techniques. First and foremost, we would um, always suggest doing a stakeholder assessment uh, or uh, what we might call a situation assessment. So that's really looking at the background, either through interviews, reviewing background materials, assessing the realities, the, the different sideboards, the history, the relationships, the project-based needs, the schedule, the constraints, the resources needs and, and the resources available, and to help develop alternatives for what a good stakeholder engagement process might be. Within that, you might start identifying who those stakeholders are, the substance of issues that stakeholders are interested in, those barriers to participation, options to overcome those barriers, and, and so on. Um, as Lauren mentioned earlier, uh, you might want to consider uh, establishing a balanced stakeholder advisory group. As I mentioned on the Missouri River, we have a group. For those um, who aren't familiar with U.S. geography, the, the Missouri River covers one-sixth of the land mass of the United States. It, it runs through, depending on how you count tributaries, between eight and ten states. And we, run a, we, we work with a stakeholder group that includes uh, 14 federal agencies, all eight states, um, 29 Native American tribes, and all of the interest groups, which they subdivided into 11 categories, and then two um, organizations or people were elected to fill the roles of representing those interest groups. So that's one example of a, of a stakeholder advisory group that tries to be balanced between all the interests. Um, and then, of course, identifying approaches to overcome barriers um, to participation. Here are some examples, travel support, um, sub-regional engagement technologies like what we're using and, and so forth. So with that, um, we're going to move on to our next one. And Lauren? Great. So the next um, principle we're going to look at is transparency and openness. Um, and in order to be transparent in a planning process, adequate information about the planning and decision making must be communicated to stakeholders. This should include planning and decision-making information about the design, research, and options for a marine spatial plan. And in many cases, these topics should be discussed in public with considerable exploration of the benefits and drawbacks of various options. Being transparent and open can help develop an understanding of and support for complex public planning processes among interested groups in the public. In order to create openness, the planning process and decision makers must actively solicit feedback and have interest in listening to and using the input from user groups, conservation interests, government entities, and other constituencies will be affected by the plan. Um, some guidance in order to create transparency and openness in your process. Establish clear and consistent communication channels. 
disseminate information about the planning process for review and feedback, and demonstrate openness to learning from stakeholders. Multi-tiered communication tools, including websites, public meetings and workshops, written materials, and stakeholder meetings can be used to disseminate information and gather feedback. Websites and wikis, which are you know, more two-way communication tools, are also useful to augment public meetings. Be clear in your process up front about what feedback is being sought, as well as how stakeholders and the public should provide feedback. For example, what are the relevant documents to view? Are you requesting feedback through an online wiki, an upcoming public meeting, or perhaps a survey mechanism? Multi-tiered communication approaches help to both meet the different needs of um, interest levels for engagement from stakeholders, and also help to ensure that it's accessible um, to all your stakeholders in one way or another. And lastly, in order to be fully transparent and open, communicate to stakeholders and the public regarding how input received from those groups was used in the decision-making process. Um, and one example we have of this is in Rhode Island, which is one of the US states along the coast. Uh, the Rhode Island Special Area Management Plan related to one of the marine areas there. In this process, they had a central website that included all the relevant information in one place, meeting locations, agendas, transcripts, documents, presentations, science and technical reports. And during the planning process, each chapter in the plan that they were developing included an eight-step public review process. And this was designed and laid out to everyone from the start of the overall process. So there was a really clear um, mechanism and pathway for that engagement. And so some more information about tools and best practices for ensuring, for ensuring transparency and openness. Implement a broad suite of communication tools and techniques, which we started talking about a little bit, um, in order to inform, educate, and receive feedback from stakeholders and the public. So you can consider newspaper ads, online social media, such as Twitter or Facebook, relevant website pages, posters or flyers. And for communication techniques to collect input, think about local dialogues, workshops, listening sessions, surveys, or an online wiki. Promote a common understanding of key processes in terminology and technical information. For example, you can create an online data portal, a one-pager of key terminology being used in the process, or create a process map of the process itself. Uh, inform stakeholders how to provide input and how it will be used. Provide periodic reports on how stakeholder or public input impacted final products. And produce and share meeting summaries. And with that, Brian, I'll it to you. All right. We're going to talk about informed engagement next. And um, so the desired outcome for informed engagement is a shared understanding of the issues, the challenges, and the planning process among decision makers, stakeholders, and the public. So there is a could be a big power gap there, right? The more information. If you have some information and others don't, um, that could be perceived as, as uh, a power inequality. Um, and the types of information is going to be different, right? So you have policymakers who, who might think of things in terms of organizational issues, legal considerations, those kinds of things, political considerations. Um, you may have scientists who are looking at it from a very technical standpoint. You may have the stakeholders looking at it from a substantive standpoint, fishing areas, um, indigenous resources, those kinds of things. And then you may have the planners looking at it from a process perspective. And somehow all of that information needs to be integrated. Um, and I should note, it's, it's good to see there's, a, there's starting to be a lot of chat on the chat board. And I would um, keep those coming. If you have thoughts on each of these, any of these um, principles, uh, please exchange ideas. We, we hope you can learn from each other as much as you, you learn from us. Um, so if, sorry, if I can interject there just to say that we're going to try to, um, Libby just had a great question, which I copied down to the notes section. And I know Nick or Brian, when I'm speaking and vice versa, will try to copy down any of those more in-depth questions for a more uh, in-depth discussion later. But uh, otherwise, keep the chat back and forth. And sorry, Brian, continue on. Yeah, absolutely. And the question is, is there a good example of an online wiki for marine planning? So if anybody has any, there's there's 70 folks on this call. If any of you have any thoughts on that, please go ahead and chat it in. Um, so guidance for informed engagement is, um, one, is to encourage quality, informed, and interactive dialogue. And the second bullet there is to engage in mutual education. So when we talk about dialogue, it, it's 
we're talking about something different that's just gathering feedback or even a discussion. It's really the sharing of information. It's the leveling of the playing field. Um, and it may not necessarily be targeted at coming to a decision, but it's bringing people together to um, discuss their issues, to educate each other, and to start building those bonds and those relationships. Um, also, to identify opportunities for the inclusion of stakeholder knowledge and data into the process. So here's one of the key intersections of marine planning pro of the marine planning process and the stakeholder engagement process. Right, these two processes are interwoven, um, and they're one and the same in many respects. But the, this is one of the key intersection points when it comes to marine planning. Um, each interest group has their own information and data, whether it be social, cultural ecological, economic, human use, um, and all of this may be relevant to ocean management, so it needs to be incorporated in some way to develop a good product. Um, could be traditional or experiential place-based knowledge. I think one good story is of the Narragansett um, Indian tribe here in the United States on the East Coast. Uh, for years they've been saying they have um, resources, tribe, or, or um, um, cultural resources off the coast. Um, submerged on a continental shelf that had been um, um, submerged over the years. Um, and that had been, that information had been passed down through generations through oral traditions. And um, just most recently, scientists have started looking and have found some um, archaeological evidence. Um, and I saw one quote by a member of the tribe, which I thought was, um, just summed it all up. And, I'm, I'm um, paraphrasing here, but the quote was something like, after many years, science has finally caught up to our traditional knowledge for, all, for our oral history. Um, so just one story to convey the importance of that. And then to provide technical information um, in an appropriate format for stakeholder and public consumption. Uh, best practices, um, impartial facilitation can be particularly helpful in times of, or in, in situations of high conflict, low trust, when you don't have necessarily the skill sets or the capacity, that neutral presence can go a, a long way in helping focus on the sensitivity of all interests, help guiding the effort in the process, help bringing stakeholders to the table, help building trust, um, de uh, developing unbiased technical tools, tailoring presentations to uh, non-technical non audiences, um, conducting stakeholder workshops to discuss um, technical issues. And science is really at the heart of, of a lot of these processes. So that may not be enough. In some cases, we've developed neutral science panels. So working with stakeholders to select a group of scientists that then would act as, um, as a group that would um, produce or assess or analyze and, and provide feedback on certain elements of the data and the technical input put into the process. Um, and then establishing mechanisms to collect input. Um, so and now we have many more modes of doing this. The technology is really giving us many opportunities to do it in new ways through um, online polling, through webinars, um, and through many other different techniques. So um, next up, Lauren. Yep, next up we're going to speak about timeliness. And so in regards to timeliness, for engagement to be successful, it's important that stakeholders and the public have sufficient notice and time to assure their participation throughout all stages of the process. So from the earliest planning stages through the problem definition and goal setting to data accumulation and analysis and to the development of alternative scenarios from consideration. And often during the planning process, a fairly well-defined product is sometimes developed prior to gaining significant public and stakeholder input. And in some controversial or complex situations, there may be significant opposition to these project, the products. And planning entities often spend considerable time and resources then revisiting the initial product to compensate for this oversight. Um, and it can also detract from the value of the product, as the product may not actually meet everyone's needs unless there is full input. So to avoid these types of situations, it's important to include timeliness as a core element of the engagement process for stakeholders and the public. Um, to maintain timeliness in your process, coordinate the planning process and engagement activities to include stakeholder input in decision and products. 
Ideally, to achieve this, this stakeholder engagement should be intertwined with the marine planning process, not separate but together. Um, and often a process schedule can be driven by other factors outside of stakeholder engagement, um, you know, time, resources, things like that. But to the extent possible, timeliness for meaningful stakeholder participation should be included. And based upon our experience, we would recommend that ideally stakeholder and public comment periods should be at least four to six weeks in duration to allow a thorough review of documents and the coordination of comments. Uh, to accomplish this goal, the planning process should be well thought out and the timing of stakeholder and public engagement as well as review periods should be planned in some detail and far in advance. Also make sure to provide sufficient notice of meetings and outcomes to ensure that stakeholders have an adequate opportunity to participate or respond. This may include distributing that information broadly across a range of communication methods and making sure to provide advanced meeting materials for stakeholders. And one important best practice to ensure timeliness in your planning process is to develop and communicate a master project timeline that includes key deliverables, requiring input, and anticipated stakeholder meetings over the course of the planning process. Um, and of course, you know, this can be challenging to try to do all up front um, because things change. And our advice um, and experience is that if there can be at least a clear process up front um, that's outlined, that will reduce some of the anxiety among stakeholders from uncertainty of knowing how and when to participate. And then if the schedule does change, it's, it's OK. That happens. Publicly acknowledge it. Explain the reasons for the change and describe the resulting schedule adjustment. And in your planning schedule, make sure to evaluate what would be an acceptable, acceptable adequate notice for stakeholders of public meeting. Um, in our experience, that should be at least three weeks in advance or more if possible. However, taking into account different cultural norms is important here. Every group has their own culture, and that may impact what is seen as acceptable. But the key is that less notice can create a barrier to participation of some groups, and you need to account for this in the planning process. Preliminary materials for meeting discussions should also be distributed uh, before the meeting as well. And again, in our experience, we prefer no less than one week in advance to allow adequate preparation time for stakeholder discussions. It's also good practice to establish a website for schedules and materials, including materials from past meetings. But also remember to use various mechanisms to disseminate and post meeting notices, um, you know, both the website, social media, and newspaper. Um, since even though there might be one central website, not everyone might be able to access it. And Ryan, I'll let you continue here on process integrity. Okay. So process integrity, and I'm looking at the time. We have about 35 more minutes. So Lauren and I are going to try to fly through these last two um, process integrity and adaptability and flexibility to give some more time for um, dialogue. But please, um, this chat has been great. And continue um, chatting and monitoring the chat, because there's lots of good information there, far more than we can um, bring up um, verbally within this uh, within this presentation. So the desired outcome for process integrity is a trustworthy and credible planning process established through equitable and reliable action. Um, of course, you know, the challenge for, for planners is trust and credibility um, can be reduced both through real bias, but also through perceived bias. Um, and so planners need to work diligently to assure that the process is fair and equitable reflects impartial, impartial balancing of interest and reliably engages uh, stakeholders and, and the public. Um, to do that, um, you know, first would be to, um, to uh, I think all these principles will help um, create that sense of confidence in the process. But that's not it. Here's some other things. Um, schedule predictability and reliability, balanced participation, opportunities for engagement, um, gathering input, so on and so forth. So I think the considerations and, and reflecting on this, one, you can't overlook that interpersonal and that psychological component of, of engaging um, stakeholders in the public in the process. Um, and, and, and part of that was within the sense of equality across stakeholder interest and the consistency in how you engage. As I mentioned earlier, too, there's a historical component. Um, and relationships aren't built or and issues aren't resolved overnight. So there's um, there might be things that you're trying to address in your process that might be 
caused by your predecessors pressors, or it might be um, issues that have been just kind of lingering through the years, through decades um, or more. Um, so those are challenging, and, and um, part of this is about building relationships, and it's about that process. So I think the last point is really key, make a commitment to meaningful stakeholder participation and follow through. So once you have, if you have a collaborative attitude, if you're thinking in a collaborative way, you'll take the right actions, or you'll at least think in the context of taking the right actions. Uh, best practices, um, establishing participatory ground rules, so rules and responsibilities for not only the planners and decision makers, but for the, um, the stakeholders, uh, developing realistic agendas and, and meeting summaries, encouraging inclusive and balanced dialogue, and reflecting on how input is used. So Lauren, last one. Okay, great. And so our last principle we'll talk about is um, adapt adaptability and flexibility. Um, and so let's advance this. So the green planning, planning process is a long-term long policy implementation process that will take several years, if not decades. And during that time, new information will arise during the process. New stakeholder groups may emerge. Staff changes probably will occur, both in government and non-governmental organizations. And new ocean activities will rise as others decline. So adaptability and flexibility in stakeholder engagement can be really important, and it's also similar um, if anyone here is familiar with adaptive management approach to natural resources, where you may not have all the information up front, or there could be potential unintended consequences. And just as with adaptive management, any stakeholder engagement effort will need to be flexible and resilient enough to adapt to changing information and circumstances. Um, so some guidance. The needs. The need for changes in the engagement process might arise through process evaluation, changing circumstances, or through requests from stakeholder groups and members of the public. It's important to monitor, evaluate, and modify stakeholder processes as needed and based upon feedback. For example, additional venues for discussion, educational workshops, or public information mechanisms may be required that were not originally anticipated. It's also important to develop engagement methods that match regional and local issues, as well as cultures and relationships. Each coastal and marine region is unique from every other region, and may be different in terms of stakeholder interests, driving issues, cultures, relationships among sponsors and stakeholders, or financial situations. Um, a couple examples. In the US, for example, there is a formal consultation process between government agencies and tribal representatives, which is the norm for engagement on that level. Uh, another example of how this might influence the need to be flexible in this regard is in two communities that include fishers who may have set seasons with intensive hours out on the ocean, and that could require adjustments to timing for stakeholder meetings. If the norms of a certain user group or community are unknown or not accounted for in process, that can require changes to better meet everyone's needs and ensure an inclusive process. And so some best practices and ways to assure adaptability and flexibility in your process include establish engagement goals and performance measures, employ an array of measurement tools to surveys, comment forms, or assessments to gauge the effectiveness of the engagement process on at least an annual basis. And to do this, you can use any number of technology tools um, that Brian mentioned previously, like Poll Everywhere, SurveyMonkey. Um, there's a whole range that you can use to to help um, get that type of feedback um, online and through technology. Reassess the engagement process periodically and establish new methods to address the gaps where the process is not meeting expectations. Conduct an impartial assessment, which Brian will discuss in a bit more detail shortly, Focus on the issues specific to that region, and develop revisions to engagement strategy based on the findings of that assessment. Um, and with that, Brian, I'll hand it back to you for, I think you had an example of how this principle might be applied in a process. Still want to share that? Um, thanks, Lauren. I, I think um, just given the time, um, mm -hmm. I just like to keep moving. And I want to bring up a comment that um, was just, was just um, put on the chat, which I thought was, was a great um, comment. Uh, somebody mentioned we, ha we have to remember to manage expectations on what we can and what we can't deliver. Uh, marine spatial planning is not a, a, a magic silver bullet. It's a good start. Um, and so, you know, I think part of that is um, 
is one, assessing what you can do, what you think you can do, and start um, really laying, setting those ex expectations um, with stakeholders on what they can expect out of the process. Um, I think a lot of time the tension is often built not because they don't have input, uh, but because they um, expected more um, and then they didn't get what they, they didn't receive what they thought they were going to get. Um, so um, a quick look at, I'm just going to fly through these next couple slides. Um, and we have a lot more information on this, but um, just given the time constraints, we just wanted to, to set this up. Here's kind of a, 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 a broad stakeholder engagement uh, planning process. Um, just to know, we, as Lauren mentioned earlier, we suggest giving stakeholder engagement the same, um, giving an equal weight to all other components of the marine planning process. So it should be, again, at the outset of the, pro the project. It should re receive the resources and attention it needs. That doesn't mean that you're going to be able to do all the outreach in an ideal world. Uh, but again, in planning it, then you can set the expectations of what you think can and can't be done. Um, and part of that is through a situation assessment in its first um, box of, of looking at the internal and external environment, identifying stakeholders, and, and looking and ex examining their needs and, and interests. Um, second, developing the engagement plan. So de determining those goals and obje objectives. And again, this is starting to set those expectations, determining the level of engagement, and documenting the plan. Um, importantly and often overlooked, gathering feedback. So getting buy-in and really joining with stakeholders in developing a plan um, that works for them, validating your findings, um, and um, making sure you're all on board um, with a plan to move forward, and then implementing, implementing, monitoring, and improving the plan. Um, just real quick, here's a tool that we use. When we talk about collaboration these days, it could have a multitude of, of, um, of uh, definitions, and we often don't clarify those definitions. So we might say, oh, we're going to collaborate with Mike on this project. And that collaboration to you might mean I'm going to give him a call and ask him what he thinks about this product. To Mike, that might mean um, we're going to set up weekly conference calls. Um, I'm going to be an equal decision maker in the process and so on. So we use a tool like this. And this is kind of uh, this is our version, which is degrees of collaboration. It's, um, it's based off the uh, IAP2 model. IAP2 stands for the International Association of Public Participation. Um, and it just gives you different levels for the different, uh, at one, one end you have this one-way informing communication, on the other end you kind of have collaborative decision making, and then you have two levels in between. It helps you think through what collaboration means, and then it helps you communicate back out to stakeholders um, what they can expect through the process. So here's some potential pitfalls, um, and I don't, I'll just leave these up on the screen and you could, um, uh, just kind of read through these. Um, we talk about roles and responsibilities and, and goals and objectives being important. Um, stakeholder exhaustion, the second to last one, is something we've, we've talked about a little bit um, in dissent. All right, Lauren. Great, thanks, Brian. Um, so now we're going to transition to talking to kind of doing both some question and answer and trying to engage you all in some discussion. Um, so first I wanted to turn to a thread that's on our current chat that I was picking up on, Brian, while you were finishing that up. Um, I had mentioned technology at the end of that last principle, and we mentioned it throughout. And some folks were commenting on how internet access can be a challenge or uh, generational differences in comfort with technology can be a challenge as well. So I just wanted to kind of speak on that a little bit. There's been some discussion and a lot of questions around that. And Brian, you can jump in as well on this. But um, a couple different things on that. That's probably also why you've heard us say, I think, quite a few times, I feel, throughout this, um, to not just use one way of communicating, but think about you know newspapers, flyers, posters, and trying to think about the array of um, ways you might use to communicate out to stakeholder groups. 
uh, and that reason, that's another reason as well why it's important to know who your stakeholder groups are, know the local context you're working in to be able to know what might be effective uh, within those diverse options you use for communicating. Um, other things I've seen um, might be, you know, if you're having a, a tool that offers some, you know, scientific knowledge, you might be able to do a, a training or informational session with all stakeholders to get people familiar with how to use something. Or you might also be able to actually bring technology into a public meeting setting. So, um, you know, this can be something that financially might be a challenge, but in some cases, if you, there are companies that will actually rent laptops and you could use technology um, that they would help provide. Brian, I don't know if you have other thoughts on, on that. No, I think that's good. And we can, there's another question about um, is it better to go to them or have them come to us? And, um, and then one reply was there needs to be a mix of both. Um, and then I, I think I would suggest use of grassroots consultation in, in, in regions with low literacy rates and poor internet accessibility, right? So more grassroots level. Um, which sort of gets at that multi-level um, um, engagement. Um, and the question of better, is it better to go to them or having them come to us? I think the, the response, the simplified response of need a mix of both is, is right. You know, it's right on target. And um, but certainly if there's a stakeholder that needs to be involved, that's very important, that's highly impacted, that can, particularly that can impact the process, whether it's at that very time or in the future, um, working to engage them, um, you know, meeting them where they're at, finding what their needs and their interests are, what their incentives are to participate is a really important part of, of um, your activity as a planner. Great. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so at this point, the way we kind of wanted to approach our remaining time with discussion question and answer, um, was one, putting out there if there's clarifying questions on the content that we've actually presented here today. Um, so if there is, you can start, you know, you could chat those in. Or the other, um, for some of you who were on online a little bit earlier than when we started, you might have heard Nick, who was helping people try to figure out if they would be able to be connected and could actually speak. And so what Nick had said at the beginning is if you raise your hand to either make a comment or a question, um, he'll try to unmute you so you can speak, and then if there's maybe a tech issue where you can't be heard, we might have to put you back on mute, in which case we'd encourage you to instead chat in your question or comment. Um, so with that, maybe let's start to see if there's any clarifying questions. And Nick, do you want to maybe let us know if you're seeing any hands raised or if you're going to unmute anyone? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yet if anybody has anything they would like to say over audio and we didn't get a chance to test your mic earlier, um, let me know and we can uh, grant you microphone rights and see if it works. Um, if there's lots of feedback and stuff, we'll just mute you and then just ask you to type in the chat box at the bottom. I'm wondering, um, Andrea Flynn had just typed in, I like the idea of doing interactive engagement involved with other initiatives. Um, Andrea, can you expand on that? I'm just curious what um, you mean by interactive engagement. And uh, Brian and Lauren, I'm going to go back to one of the earlier slides that had the terms from the National Ocean Policy on it. So we can go over those. That was. I already went by it. There you go. Yeah. A little overzealous clicking there. <laughs> so it looks like Brian Andrew said that Shauna Turnbull mentioned it, and I think it would be a great way to entice people into participating. Um, So one question up here that I'm seeing, Brian, in your opinion, what are the main gaps in knowledge regarding MSP for research? Okay. I'm going to copy that question below. I'm wondering if there's anybody, um, if anybody has any thoughts on that. 
So when we talk about your opinion, let's um, open it up to all participants. Um, and by gaps in knowledge, I'm assuming we're talking about um, the stakeholder-based knowledge or technical knowledge or, or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Brian, I also copied over. Emily Wright had a great both question and comment that sometimes um, there's a threshold that needs to be reached in a community at which point the public is ready and eager to engage in planning efforts and before which they are less willing. And does this threshold need to be reached before planning efforts with stakeholders can be effective? If a community is not ready but planning needs to happen, what steps should be taken? Yeah, so I can take I can answer a part of that. Um, so when we get involved in an issue, we're t we typically come in on the ground floor. We'll do an assessment, a stakeholder assessment, or a situation assessment. And part of what we look for in what we call is the ripeness. Is it ripe to um, for collaborative effort? Meaning, are all the parties ready to come to the table? Is there adequate incentive for them to do that? So I, I think part of that first step is to look at all the different communities or different interest groups um, and just ask them, you know, are you, is this important to you right now? Um, how does it rank up there with your priorities? Are you willing to participate and assess their incentives for participation? If they're not, so, and if that threshold isn't reached, if, if they aren't at that point, um, then a lot of time those, those efforts might be for naught. You know, you, you might be doing something that isn't going to um, um, be accepted uh, very readily within that community. So there are things you can do. One, which is once you look, look at their incentives, try to, you might need to change your own planning effort to further incentivize them or change the situation in a way that, um, that makes it more, um, that, makes them more interested in participating. So one example, uh, I was working on an issue between three states, um, and it was it's called the Tri-State Water War here, Water War here in the United States, in, and it's between Georgia, Florida, and Alabama. And the stakeholders came together, but the states and the feds didn't want to participate. And the stakeholders, all these different groups, wanted to engage in a process. And just by creating a forum, they essentially put political pressure on the states and the feds then to want to participate um, in that process. So that's one way of changing the dynamic so, um, so it, it, it makes it more tenable or more um, appropriate for different groups to, to participate. Great, Brian. So another question I'm going to queue up for us here, and I'm going to see if I can find the slide with our definition of I don't know if it was here that you mentioned it, but so I'll, I'll read you the question, Brian. Um, on the slide, um, what's the difference between stakeholder, scientific, and public engagement? Wouldn't they all be stakeholders? Um, and I was just confused why it was stated like this and thought we'd ask. And, and Brian and I both had, you know, many discussions thinking about how to frame this in our, you know, creating of this PowerPoint. And, and part of the reason why is because you might actually have, um, kind of almost two levels of engagement. There might be a focused group of clear interest user groups, and then there might be the general public. And so the ocean is really a resource that could potentially impact everyone. And so although it's easy to say, OK, well, you have fishing communities, you have this, you have that, you might be able to identify more or less your interest groups that you want to reach out to and interact with. But then it's important to think about the public at large, because the, inter because the ocean is a resource that would be um, accessible or shared to the public. And so when we've talked about this, we've thought about you know both the specific stakeholder engagement, and that might be one level where people might want to be engaged at a higher level because they have specific expertise, they're ocean users, and they want to be engaged at a deeper level, where there might also be a more public engagement level where it's more um, you know, about making sure to put information out to the wider public. And they might not be interested in engaging directly in a dialogue as much, but they should also still be aware. And Brian, I don't know if you want to add some more on that, or maybe talk about the scientific engagement piece? Yeah, I, I think, um, well, yeah, I would second everything you said. And then um, I think how you define it is, um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we cast as of why the net is absolutely possible. And that could include scientists and academics as well as, as others. 
Um, but, you know, it all comes down to your process how, and, and what makes the most sense in that context, right? So, you know, we also define this when we, when we were working through this, we were doing it under the context of national ocean policy where the federal agencies, the states, and um, the sovereign tribal governments were not stakeholders. They were part of the regional planning body, bodies. They were decision makers and planners, and everybody else were stakeholders. Um, but if you even broaden it past that, if you're looking at an entire process um, not already kind of shaped by, by, um, by law or policy, you might consider all federal interests, all federal government agencies as stakeholders. You might include the states as stakeholders. Um, so it, it's really just a, a, a manner of defining it and for your own process and, and then working within that context. And you know, for everything, we would suggest going as broad as possible to begin with, and then refining and narrowing as you go. Um, Brian, another couple of questions I have copied down from our chat. So um, they're, they're both, I think, very interrelated and perhaps kind of the similar question. Um, one person raised that in marine social planning or other complex processes, sometimes it's hard for stakeholders to perceive the direct output of their engagement, and some of them even feel lost or unable to attend all the engagement requirements they receive. How could we make engagement smarter? And then uh, I think Shauna Turnbull also added along a similar line that uh, the Fundy Bay research showed people felt too ill-informed to comment in a meaningful way and too many unknown unknowns. <laughs> and they did not know what they did not know about marine uh, renewables. And so maybe we can speak a little bit on how to you know, help, help build that capacity. I don't know if you want to start, Brian. Well, yeah, and I'd also I'd, I'd like to start by asking if, any, if anybody has any thoughts that they'd like to either chat in or or, um, or raise their hand and would like to to um, talk to this in any way, um, and we can we can take this on while we get those thoughts. But I, you know, there um, I think there are a number of different tools and techniques. Again, it's very situational dependent, um, and it's a big issue, right? These are technical problems. Um, very scientific, very technical, very detailed, um, and you have scientists who are storming ahead, and then you have stakeholders or members of the public who might be lay people um, and maybe don't have that degree of knowledge, one, of the technology you're using, but two, even of the substance that you're, you're discussing. So some of the techniques that we had talked about earlier of, of really trying to um, um, create information and presentations and distribute information in, uh, in a way that's easily explained to, to folks. Um, that's one technique. Opening up dialogues between the technical staff and between stakeholders is another way. Um, having, you know, if you need certain, a certain group um, that's, that's really knowledgeable and understanding a stakeholder advisory group and having more in-depth dialogue with, with certain people over a period of time could, could develop that capacity as well. Um, trainings, um, there, there are a number of different things. Um, and that's what I'm seeing sort of in the comments to capacity building, um, training on engagement. Yeah, um, and Walton also mentioned actually going through a mock process that would actually help make stakeholders feel better equipped to engage and contribute? Yeah. Um, you know, and I think it's important, too, that the tools, and this is a challenge, right, of creating tools that um, are understandable and that are, are um, that stakeholders can see, uh, might be able to play with, test, all those kinds of things, and also are transparent enough that they have faith that it's giving good, good um, output that is not being tampered with behind the scenes, and that's a challenge in and of itself. This is another one, Brian, I'll read off from Jennifer McCain. Um, she said that we worked with our local libraries who hosted researchers to present information. We worked with the researchers to make their presentations people-friendly, so very accessible. I like that, Jennifer. Yeah. 
Okay, great comments. Um, I don't. I, I I've been trying to keep up with our um, absolutely fabulous chat here, and I don't see any other questions we might have looked over. I see some people about to chat in, but maybe as we wait to see what those people might say, we have just about five more minutes here, Brian. So. Do you want to just maybe see what they have to say and then wrap up, or should we throw one more question out there? Um, well, let's see what these last couple of comments are. Um, so Jennifer. Well, one thing I, I wanted to bring up that was interesting here was from, from Shauna about uh, they didn't know what they didn't know about marine renewables. I think that's kind of interesting. If you guys had anything you wanted to add about that. Um, so where is that comment? Uh, it's... Uh, it, for my chat window, it's just below uh, Sarah Winter's chat um, about Fundy Bay Research. I can maybe start on that, Brian. One of the things that we teach um, in our work is interest-based negotiation and helping um, parties understand what their interests are, what their knowledge is, um, what their motivations within a context is to be able to help put that all out there so you can have a solution that's mutually agreeable and meets all those needs. And so. Um, you know, that's that's one of the things that Brian had mentioned. I think, I forget which slide, but, you know, having a neutral trained facilitator, someone who can actually help parties that might not realize what expertise they have to bring to the table or what really their interests might be, you know, a skilled facilitator or neutral can help um, really design a process of dialogue to help uncover what those might be for different stakeholder groups and really help set the stage by getting that, all that out there to have a very productive um, you know, uh, process then towards what would be solutions that would meet everyone's needs and how can we, you know, find something that will meet all those different interests and expertise that we might have at the table. Yeah, and just to add to that, so the opposite of interest-based negotiation is position-based negotiation. So, um, you know, one fishing group might say, this, this area is really important to us and you know, the only solution here is one where this remains an open, openly fished area. Um, so that's an example of, of a position. And so, you know, working to create a dialogue that is more around, well, economically it's important for us to be able to fish to X degree or X many days or to bring in X amount. Um, how can we do that and start with that? So that's the interest, right? There's an economic interest. There's the need to support my family. There's a, the generational interest of my family has been doing this for years. Um, so that's the level of dialogue um, we always hope to get to within that. Yeah, and Marta, I just saw your question on there. How do you deal with stakeholders' hidden agendas? And I think what we're speaking to hopefully helps answer that of, you know, people come in with these positions, as we are talking about, and there might be, you know, what we perceive as hidden agendas behind those, which are really what Brian and I are talking about, of getting at what are those underlying interests or emotions or, you know, history that's motivating someone in a process. And the more that you can do up front to uncover those for all the groups at the table can help, um, you know, help create a more uh, focused process so you don't have those underlying in the process and suddenly discover what you perceive as a hidden agenda, but you have a really clear sense of what all those interests are and can work within that context more clearly. Yeah. One of the, the most valuable questions I've, I've um, ever come across as a facilitator or in a, in a situation like this is just to use the question why. And I know hidden means that they're strategically trying to, to hide information. But even to ask that internally, if somebody says, well, this is what I want or this is what I need, um, and the next question is, well, why exactly is that? Why is that important to you? Um, and again, they may not want to share that, but you can at least ask yourself and start trying to um, figure out what some of those underlying interests are. Um, I think the more safe space you create, the more um, open folks will be with that kind of information. Brian, I know we're um, getting close on time, and I'll just give a last, um, you know, maybe touch on the, where the conversation, the chat's gone. Um, people have been talking a little bit more about um, doing kind of a mock uh, stakeholder process to get people comfortable, and it seems like um, 
Kamal mentioned the Irish Sea pilot project was a good example of mock processes for UK stakeholder management. Uh, ooh, Nick, I think you just cleared, someone just cleared this chat. Someone else had a good example in there, but it's disappeared. <laughs> um, so there's some examples in there. And Brian, I don't know if you've had any experience with doing a, um, some sort of mock process to help stakeholders feel comfortable and have the capacity. Um, no, I haven't. And right now I feel awful because I think I accidentally cleared the chat. It's very, <laughs> um, and it was so rich. Um, oh boy. Um, okay. Well, sorry everybody for that. And but no, I, I don't have any experience with with mock stakeholder processes. I, the if anybody else has has those experiences, I'd be really interested in hearing about that. Yeah, somebody mentioned Battelle does have um, CMSP training, which includes stakeholder engagement aspect to it. Right. Um, let's, um, I think we should go ahead and close, though, yeah. we're at the end of our, our hour. And let me let me just go back one more. Um, right. So just a heads up, you'll, you'll receive the presentation in the white paper. Um, we, we got an overwhelming response to this, so we will be providing this, this webinar again. Um, with with open channels and um, and then um, the webinar is also available for specific audiences. So if you're interested uh, for your region or um, other groups, um, we're we're happy to at least talk about that possibility. So just let us know. Um, here's Lauren and, and my contact information. Um, that link you don't need to copy down. Like I said, we'll send you the the principles. Um, but otherwise, I you know I really want to thank everybody. One for being here, but two, just for the really rich um, interaction um, that there was. We'd hope to get more verbal interaction, and that's one of the challenges. And we'd love to get your feedback if you have any thoughts on how to do that, because we think that um, that would be so awesome to do and such a valuable tool for everybody. But you know, without it, the chat has been extremely valuable, and I just want to thank everybody for contributing um, your thoughts as we've gone through this and, and again for your time. So with that, I don't know Nick or John if you guys want to you want to close close it out or uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you guys so much again for offering this training with us. Uh, and thank everybody for joining us with this. Um, I will send you all out uh, an email with the, the documents that uh, Brian and Lauren were just talking about and a link to the recording too. Uh, we should have the recording up in about two or three hours or so. Uh, so again, thank you all so much. And thank you, Brian and Lauren, for doing all this. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.